Welcome to CIS and bladder cancer. What does this diagnosis mean? This is a patient insight webinar from the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. Early stage tumors in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer or NMIBC are generally confined to the lining of the bladder and they may be papillary and look a little bit like tiny finger-like clusters or flat velvety patches known as carcinoma in situ or CIS. Tumors that are CIS have a very high rate of recurrence and possible disease progression. So it's really helpful to understand your diagnosis. Tonight, Beacon is welcome, welcoming urologist Peter Black from the Vancouver General Hospital in Canada and pathologist Dr. Hikmat Almadi from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. And we're delighted to have you here to help us talk about CIS and what patients need to know. So welcome to both of you. I'm gonna turn my video off and Dr. Black, if you wanna take it away. Perfect, thank you, Stephanie, very much for the invita invitation and, and the opportunity. Um, you know, I, I think I can speak for Hikmat as well that we're both passionate about bladder cancer. And so we're, we're always very happy to, to um, you know, explain what we know and, and educate. So hopefully um, the attendees tonight will find this interesting. Uh, Hikmat and I are gonna go back and forth a little bit. I'll, I'll start and then, and then um, we'll switch to Hikmat and, and uh, we'll carry on like that. So what is carcinoma in situ? Uh, Stephanie alluded to a little bit at the beginning. Um, we have this, this broad spectrum of uh, disease stages for bladder cancer from the very superficial on the um, left and, and carcinoma in situ is also called TIS. So it's just right on the, on the surface of the bladder um, to tumors that actually extend into the lumen of the bladder, but still set on the surface. That's the TA just next to that. Sorry, I'm, I'm moving my mouse, but of course you're not seeing my mouse, but thank you, Stephanie. I think you're moving the mouse <laughs> perfectly. And then the T1 tumors that are already invading the first layer of the bladder wall. And, and those, those three together are, are all non-muscle invasive, but there's a difference between actually invasive T1 and the other two that are really non-invasive. And then on the right, we have the muscle invasive, which we're not gonna talk about this evening. Uh, next slide. And there's, there's special things about carcinoma in situ that make it really worth having a, a dedicated session just on this. So it's, it's a flat tumor. There's no uh, tumor extending into the lumen of the bladder. It's often red and velvety, uh, but sometimes it's invisible. So we're, we're actually, um, we, we struggle to see it in a lot of patients. Although it's an early stage of bladder cancer, it is high grade. By definition, it's always high grade and therefore it has a significant malignant potential. It has the potential to develop into muscle invasive bladder cancer so even though it's early stage, we take it very seriously and we treat it uh, quite aggressively because we need to eradicate it. One of the problems that we also struggle with is that this transition from a non-invasive uh, superficial um, carcinoma in situ into a, a potentially invasive and muscle-invasive tumor is very unpredictable. Next slide. Some other key features is that it's often, um, or if, if it's found together with the other non-muscle invasive bladder cancer stages, so TA and T1, it indicates a higher risk of recurrence and progression. So uh, the fact that the cancer can come back or it can turn into something more invasive if there's carcinoma in situ there. So it's, it's a, an additional risk factor in patients who have other disease stages. Carcinoma in situ we assume is multifocal. So it's at different locations in the bladder or even diffuse, meaning anywhere you would sample the bladder wall, you would find carcinoma in situ. That's a, that's a very important and special feature. The other tumors generally we consider to be confined to what we see and what we resect. Um, because it's multifocal and, and diffuse, we generally believe that we cannot resect it completely with a transrethral resection, um, which again is different from the other bladder tumors that typically we can resect uh, at least all visible disease. And so since we can't resect it, we either need to treat it with intravesical therapy, such as BCG, or we need to remove the bladder um, if we really wanna get rid of it all. And that's why it's, it's really tricky and a bit different than the other bladder tumors. Next slide. So I'm gonna uh, present a patient profile and then um, Hikmat and I will go back and forth a little bit about some of the issues related to this patient's uh, bladder cancer. 
So this patient is an 87 year old gentleman, retired chartered accountant, uh, who has been a long time smoker, uh, more than 50 year uh, pack year history of smoking. He was found uh, just on a regular check with his primary care provider uh, to have red blood cells in his urine under microscopy. He's never seen um, blood himself. So there's no gross hematuria, just microscopic hematuria. He has uh, symptoms that are, are common for his age, nothing particularly severe or, or noteworthy extreme. He gets up a couple of times at night. Um, there's some urgency to avoid. He has very significant other health issues. So he has heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, and he's even on home oxygen um, because he has emphysema uh, also related to his smoking history. So one, one thing that's relatively clear when we look at this gentleman is that he's probably not gonna be uh, fit from a general health point of view to, to undergo a radical cystectomy to remove the bladder. We're not necessarily at that point yet, but I, I just wanted to, to highlight that in his uh, medical history. So his family doctor, um, based on the microhematuria and, and the risk factors, uh, sent his urine for a urine cytology. Um, can you go back for a second? I just, uh, and and the, the diagnosis of the urine cytology is high-grade urethial carcinoma. And so Hikmat's gonna run us through a little bit what that means. All right, uh, thank you, Peter, for the lead-in and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, 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 thanks you for tuning in and spending the evening with us. And it's my pleasure to uh, share this hour with you and talk to you about uh, urothelial carcinoma in situ and uh, different aspects of the disease. And hopefully you'll find it uh, helpful. Uh, so as, as the, uh, the, the story started, you know, the, uh, a quick test is urine sample. Uh, it's a very easy you know, type of specimen to get. Uh, just require you know, a, the urine sample that you may get in the clinic or the office. It is sent to the pathology department. Uh, it's spun down uh, just to concentrate the cells in, the, in, in that container. And then will it give us a, a better opportunity to detect the, any atypical cells in there. And, and when, you know, uh, when uh, slides are pre prepared, the tissue is stained, uh, then we'll be able to have you know, the ability to visualize cells that, in, uh, that are, are very, um, uh, that can tell us what what they what they constitute they're you know benign or reactive or or abnormal cells and we follow a system there is a system this this type of specimens have been studied for a long time and there is there are criteria that we apply every time we analyze these uh, these type of samples and then we follow the most recent system is the paris system and it has different categories and and every case every urine sample that that goes to the lab the result come back with one of these uh, categories <clears throat> Of, of course, the, the red flag would be, or when we highly suspect a urothelial carcinoma is in these two categories that are in bold now, the number four and five. Either we see some atypical cells that are atypical enough to suspect urothelial carcinoma, but they're not as, as many of them as you would want. And the, the cutoff has been made as 10 cells. If you see more than 10 cells that are uh, very atypical, and I'm going to show you in some of these features what we mean by atypical in the next slide. These are these are what you say suspicious. When you see these atypical cells in a quantity that is high enough, and as I said, this is typically more than 10 cells, then you can render the diagnosis of high-grade urothelial carcinoma. In urine cytology, you may not be able to say in situ or or, or papillary because most of the times the, the that designation requires more architectural assessment rather than individual cells. So I'm gonna show you an example how, how the, uh, the urothelial carcinoma cells in the, in the urine may look like. If you go to the next slide, uh, Stephanie, uh, then another click. Yes, yeah, so this is, this is like a high magnification image from a urine cytology specimen taken from under the microscope. And, and these are the individuals as these dark purple or blue uh, structures in the middle of the picture. These are, the nuclei, the, the nucleus, the nuclei of, of the tumor cells. You can see how they're different in size and shape, uh, different in the, the, the darkness quality. These are like chromatin quality. Uh, they have like indentations, projections. These are all atypical features that are not, do not resemble normal cells that we are very familiar how they look like. And with this type of features altogether, uh, with the abundance of these cells in the urine sample, we can comfortably say that this is a diagnostic of a high-grade urothelial carcinoma. 
So urine cytology, as I said, it's a very simple process. It's a simple test, doesn't require much. It's not invasive. You don't, you don't stick a needle or anything, just you know, a urine sample in the office. It's very sensitive for high-grade urethia carcinoma. It's less sensitive uh, for lower-grade lesions because, again, you need to see atypical features that are obvious here in low-grade lesions. You don't see uh, um, uh, the same features. And it's also specific, which means if you don't see these atypical cells, you, you have a high confidence that you're, you're not seeing a high-grade urethial carcinoma. And this is why you can say it's very, uh, very specific. So if you go to the next slide, just to show you where these cells might come. So this is a tissue section. This is like a biopsy, the result of the biopsy. Processed in a similar way, a little bit different because you have to prepare, you have to fix the tissue and cut the sections and make them into a slide. As you can see at the top in both, both these images, uh, all these dark uh, cells that have different sizes and shapes, these are all malignant cells. Uh, with this tissue section, I can call, easily call it your theory carcinoma in situ because I have architecture. But as you can see, the individual cells are coming off of the, of the, of the main tissue fragment and they'll be like sloughed off or shed into the urine. And this is what will make up the positive urine cytology. So I'll turn it back to you, Peter, I think for the next set of slides. Terrific. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, from, from the urologist perspective, the urine cytology is so important um, because we often don't see carcinoma in situ. So uh, that's something we'll come back to um, while we're talking. So this gentleman um, had a CT scan. So he had, he had blood in his urine. So that's part of the usual workup and everything was normal with the kidneys and ureters. Remember that carcinoma in situ and, and indeed any cancer of the bladder, you can get the similar, very similar lesions in the renal pelvis and the ureters um, in, in the um, upper tracts. On cystoscopy, however, um, there was a red patch uh, on the, uh, the back of the bladder and it was a little bit raised. It wasn't the typical sort of cauliflower tumor um, that we often see, but it was, it was certainly suspicious, especially given the, uh, the positive cytology. So this gentleman, we took to the operating room uh, for a resection of this area that you see in the, in the micrograph here. Next slide, please. And an important uh, consideration, again, is, is particularly with carcinoma in situ is the use of enhanced cystoscopy. And there are two types, two different methods with which we can enhance the cystoscopy. On the left-hand side, you see the CISU, which is the trade name. It's also called blue light cystoscopy or fluorescent cystoscopy. Um, PDD is often used in, in Europe as, as a terminology, it's photodynamic diagnosis. But here you put uh, a substance into the bladder prior to the surgery, uh, prior to the TRBT, and it's taken up and metabolized by cancer cells so that uh, these cells then fluoresce. And when you shine a blue light on it, a fluorescent light, or well, a blue light, the, the cells will fluoresce and they appear a bright pink. So they really stand out. And we know that we can um, detect more tumors this way and especially more carcinoma in situ. So up to 40% more carcinoma in situ. So it's particularly valuable, again, because we often overlook them on regular white light cystoscopy. On the right-hand side, we have narrow band imaging um, which is a little bit different. Uh, it it, it uh, uses filters to um, pull out the blue and the green wavelengths that really accentuates blood vessels and changes in, in um, blood vessel patterns, vascularity uh, will often accentuate tumors so that we can see them better. It's a little bit easier to use because it's just a flip of a switch on the device and it doesn't require putting anything into the bladder, uh, but the evidence for its use is not as widespread. Uh, next slide. And I just wanna highlight some of the differences in fluorescent cystoscopy. And this is, I think, particular to the US market actually, because it's not necessarily available everywhere, but you can actually do fluorescent cystoscopy at the time of uh, a surveillance cystoscopy in the office. If, if a patient has had a prior bladder cancer and they're undergoing their, their routine cystoscopy, you can do fluorescent cystoscopy. Um, that, for example, is not available for us uh, in Canada. Or um, you can do it which is, which is more common, more universal, you do it at the time of a bladder tumor resection or biopsy. So that if, if a patient has an identified tumor, um, you go to the operating room, you give them the reagent beforehand, and then you use it at the time of resection. So there are two different uses. And, and I think um, as, as patients and caregivers, you need to be clear on the differences. So on the left-hand side, if we're talking about what we do at the time of surveillance cystoscopy, so it's, 
It's used to detect a recurrence. It's primarily patients with intermediate and high risk disease. So they, they've had tumors before um, based on the, on the prior tumor characteristics. We know that they're high risk for recurrence and we especially do it early on in their disease course. So if they had a tumor three months ago and it's the first look, then you know, that might be a time when we do it. Um, we always have to consider the, the cost and, and the treatment burden of, of all these tests. Um, we can also do it, for example, if we see something on white light that we're not, and white light's the, the usual cystoscopy, if we're not quite sure what it is, this might help us decide, yes, we need to biopsy that, or no, we don't need to biopsy it. Um, and overall, there's, there's especially one, one very good American trial that shows that it enhances the detection of high-grade recurrence. For the, on the, on the right-hand side now, the, um, when we're using this at the time of resection, um, there's very good data from, from multiple trials, North American and European trials, that tell us that we'll detect more tumors, we'll resect more thoroughly, patients will have a lower risk of recurrence, and that, that's a very important uh, endpoint. In particular, for what we're talking about, we'll also find more carcinoma in situ. Next slide. And so I want to highlight one um, specific scenario that comes up routinely and, and is, is particularly relevant for carcinoma in situ. I know there was already um, a question in the, uh, in, the, in the chat or the Q&A about carcinoma in situ of the upper tracts and upper tracts are the ureters and, and the renal pelvis. And so one scenario that we see sometimes are patients uh, who come in to the office with a urine cytology that clearly shows um, abnormal cells. So it says, you know, high grade urethral carcinoma. So there are malignant cells there, but we don't see anything on cystoscopy and we don't see anything on a CT scan. And there we have a, a sort of a, a specific um, algorithm that we run through. And we know, for example, that carcinoma in situ, so something flat in the in a ureter or renal polyps is not gonna be visualized on CT scan. And we might not even see it actually when we look at it with the camera and we can't do the fluorescent cystoscopy in the upper tract. So it can be particularly tricky. So what we do is we, uh, we go to the operating room, we get urine from the right ureter and separately from the left ureter so that we can, if it is coming from one side or the other, we can, we can determine that definitively. If we find urine, let's say from the right renal pelvis, then the cytology is positive, but we don't see anything with the camera, we don't see anything on CT scan, then we, we call that carcinoma in situ. We assume there's carcinoma in situ there, even though we don't see it. The other thing we do then, so if in a patient like this, it's still more likely that it's actually from the bladder and we're just not seeing it. And so in the bladder, we will do the fluorescent cystoscopy and we'll biopsy whatever we see there. And then in men, we always have to consider that it could be coming from the prostatic urethra where you can also get carcinoma in situ. Um, so it can be quite tricky, upper tracts, bladder and prostatic urethra. Next slide. So our patients, um, you recall he had the positive cytology and the red patch in the posterior bladder wall. We took him to the operating room for a resection and we used the fluorescent cystoscopy. It lit up the patch that we saw, but it also lit up a second patch, bright pink. And you can get an idea from these pictures here, which of course are not actually from this patient. I, I stole these, but on, on the left-hand side, the regular white light, you, you wouldn't, don't really appreciate much with a, even an experienced eye. Yet on the right-hand side, it's, it's, it's really uh, night and day. It's very clear that there's something there. Um, so this lesion was resected in addition to the other one that we saw. And the patient did well with the surgery, no complications. Next slide. And so we sent the sample off to Dr. Al Amadi, who's going to go through the pathology for us. All right. So uh, this is kind of um, a stepwise process. So we every sample that is removed in the clinic or the office goes to the pathology department. And in the next few slides, I'll just walk you through some of the you know the, the process and some of the classification or how we make the diagnosis, how we look, how we evaluate these specimens. And then at the end, I'm going to show you a slide that would represent that actual um, uh, you know, biopsy from this gentleman. Uh, so when we look, you know, before we, start, once we start eval the evaluation of, the, of, any, of any bladder, can, uh, bladder sample, in our mind is when we find a malignant process, where can we, we ask the question, where can we fit it from the current classification? And as uh, Dr. Black alluded to in the beginning, 
you have non-invasive spectrum of, of tumors that are in the non-invasive category, and we have those can be, you know, the carcinoma in situ, which is the subject of tonight's discussion. And then you can have papillary lesions that can be low grade and high grade, as opposed to the in situ, which is always a high grade. There are some rare benign, benign tumors that we call them papillomas. They have distinct morphologic features. And then the tumor starts invading, and then you can the tumor can invade into the lamina propria, which is the most superficial layer of the bladder wall, or the, uh, the one underneath the, the surface lining, and then the deep invasive disease. And it's the, this is our main challenge. It's where can we fit this, this lesion that we identify on these histologic sections in any of these categories? So if we go next slide. <clears throat> uh, so this is when we come into, uh, we identify the malignant process, you know, it's a urothelial carcinoma. Now, can we place it into in situ, flat disease or papillary? And, and this is what it is. You know, you look at the image on the left, this is the definition of urothelial carcinoma in situ. You've, we've identified these cells that are very atypical. Again, the features that we use are the, the variation in the size and shape, the variation in the, the coloring of, 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 the, of these tumor cells, how they space, are they overcrowded? Are they like not respecting each other's borders? Uh, and then there are some other features that uh, I may point to, and I, I apologize if this may seem, may sound too technical, but I'm happy to kind of discuss or answer any questions if you think, uh, and if it you know, might need more explanation. When the cells divide, they, they form some, a structure called mitosis, which is a sign of you know, dividing and cells and a growing tumor. You can see a lot of mitosis in, in, in these tumors. Uh, as compared to the picture on the right, which is the, the papillary tumors, which are basically a finger-like projections, uh, and, and this is how the tumor grows, into the lumen of the bladder. Uh, it's simple recognition of the pattern that can tell you it's a flat versus papillary uh, disease, and these are all things that are in the, in the slide that you can see uh, as, it's a, you know, by definition, high-grade disease. Uh, and it's a tumor that's just growing as if on the flat, the surface of the, of the bladder. Uh, next slide. Uh, you know, fortunately and unfortunately, just to make things difficult and challenging, the urothelial carcinoma in situ can come in different forms and shapes. Uh, and these are just different examples. Uh, I just wanted to show you, uh, just to kind of put some an image to, to, to the name, so to speak. And we always rely on reference to the normal urothelium, which is the image on the, on the top left. Uh, here you can see, uh, it doesn't take much. You can see comparing the, this image to all the other five images, you could see how we use the reference normal urothelium to help us identify abnormal lesions. Normal urothelium is very orderly structure, multiple layers of different types of cells, start from the base all the way to the top. All of these cells are important. They have normal functions in the bladder. For example, this middle layer can can be like four or five cell thick, but it can become two cell thick if the bladder is a distended one, you know, and, and it becomes flattened. All the other images on the, on, the, on the right and the bottom, these are different shapes of urothelial carcinoma in situ. Again, highlighting the features that, are, that we rely on and we use uh, the variation in the size and shape, the discoloration, uh, the growth, of, uh, growth pattern. Uh, some of these patterns can be deceptive, like the one on the top left. These are, uh, these large cells are individual tumor cells just growing along the normal urothelium. We use the term vegetoid spread, but, but this, this could be challenging. And this could be one of these examples where not many tumor cells go into the urine, for example, because these cells are just growing under normal urothelium compared to the picture in the middle and the bottom. This is when you have a lot of discohesive, so, you know, disjointed tumor cells that can easily shed uh, into the urine. The, the last image on, on the bottom right, this is a, a tumor uh, carcinoma cyto that is involving some normal invaginations in the bladder mucosa. We call them von Braun nests. Uh, sometimes all the surface urothelium is denuded. You don't see any malignant cells, but you could see these tumor cells inside these invaginations. And sometimes that can make it more difficult uh, uh, to treat. Uh, if we go next slide. Uh, so as, as much as we want to believe that, you know, there is always, uh, or we want to think of the urothelial carcinoma site as distinct from papillary tumors. A lot of times they coexist or, uh, or, they, or they overlap, coexist, or they develop after one another. And these are some terms that we use primary urothelial carcinoma cyto or primary CIS is when, when the first presentation is urothelial carcinoma cyto with no associated papillary tumor. Or we can have secondary CIS where there is you know, urothelial carcinoma cyto developing 
concomitantly with or uh, after a that prior diagnosis of of uh, a battery erythelial carcinoma. Uh, of course, you know there's always attempt to try to link this to dif differences in outcome or responses to types of therapy, even though it's not necessarily conclusive yet. Uh, but it seems that uh, people, some people believe that primary erythelial carcinoma site may be associated with the with the worst response rate to these conservative treatments. Uh, next slide. So this is one example I wanted to show you is like, uh, as I said, as long as we, as much as we like to keep them separate and unique, uh, sometimes they coexist. And this is one example here. This is the same TUR specimen from the same individual. You can see them grouped together, coming together within the, within the same container from the same patient. If you look at the higher magnification picture on the right top, this is a papillary tumor. You can see these, you know, finger-like projections sticking up and sticking into the bladder wall or the bladder lumen versus the picture on the bottom. It's the growth is very flat just along the surface urethelium, and that's a, a distinct growth pattern for urethelial carcinoma situs. So a papillary tumor and a flat disease can coexist within the same specimen. Next. Uh, and of course, you know, another important thing, uh, when we assess, when we evaluate the, the urethelium here, and every time we see urethelial carcinoma situs, the next most important thing is to determine whether there is any amount of invasive disease or, or whether this tumor is it's purely non-invasive urethelial carcinoma in situ. And, and we look carefully at the base of, of the, the surface urethelium, and we, we are carefully uh, evaluating the stroma underneath it, this, this, this layer that are loose underneath it. When we start seeing these individual cells that are highlighted by these green arrows or arrowheads, that's when we start you know, calling this invasive disease. And depending on the level of invasion and the amount of the invasive disease, we can call it focal superficial. And if it goes deeper than the, the first layer, if, it's, if it remains in the first layer, you call it laminar propio invasion or T1 disease, as, as you, you might hear uh, about it. And if it goes uh, further deep into the bladder wall, it may inv invade the, the muscular layer. We call it muscle invasive bladder cancer. These features are not depicted here on the slide. Though. Okay, next, uh, I think we went back, so. Uh, yes, next slide. Yeah, so this is another example that Dr. Black allude, alluded to that could present challenges in evaluating your theory carcinoma site. So this is a tumor that is involving uh, the, here what we see in the picture is involvement of prosthetic ducts, which are immediately underneath the, the urethra. So this is a tumor that kept kind of crawling along the surface urethelium involving the urethra and went all the way into the, prosthetic ducts. It's not invasive, it just keeps colonizing all these ducts and makes it, uh, it, makes it difficult to, re to detect sometimes, difficult to remove and difficult to treat overall. Next. So this is going back now to the actual uh, uh, case here in this, in this uh, uh, presentation. This is the biopsy from the gentleman. And as you can see, after I showed you all the slides, now everyone should be able to recognize that yes, these cells are very atypical. They're different sizes and shapes, different colors. Uh, they don't respect each other's borders. There are some, some uh, 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 a lot of atypia in, in amongst them. So this is diagnostic of urethelial carcinoma in situ. 